giving away money is hard work, especially if you want to have a big impact in the world. It's really about helping people dig deep to reflect on the purpose of their wealth and assets and to think about how they can create a bigger legacy beyond that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crazy Good Turns, the podcast that recognizes and celebrates people who do great things for others. I'm your host, Frank Blake. In today's episode, we bring you a fascinating conversation with Alexa Cortez Caldwell. You may not know her name, but there's a good chance her work has affected a nonprofit near you. Alexa is the founder of Open Impact, which advises some of the biggest and most highly resourced foundations and individual philanthropists on earth. As you'll hear later, Open Impact's typical client has more than a billion dollars in philanthropic assets. But you don't have to be a billionaire or millionaire to find value in what Alexa shares with us today. She's given a lot of thought to philanthropy and on how to make an impact on society. So if you work or volunteer for a nonprofit, her advice can help you be better and connect with more available resources. Or if you're a donor or considering supporting an organization, she shares tips on how to do that in a strategic and intelligent way. Or if you're a listener who comes to Crazy Good Turns for inspiration, I think you'll come away impressed with how Alexa spent college playing poker with homeless people and then within a few years of graduating, became director of the Schwab Foundation. But before we dive into our interview with Alexa, I wanted to give a listener shout out. I mentioned in the last podcast that I would do this with suggestions sent in by uh, listeners. And this one's a little uh, different because it involves a prior guest. Following the last show, I got a great email from Quincy Larson, the founder of Free Code Camp, which uh, was a great prompt for me to go back and see what Quincy and Free Code Camp has been doing during 2021. And it truly is impressive and amazing. In this past year, Free Code Camp has provided the educational equivalent of 4,000 years of free uh, computer learning for its students. And when you look at the comments made by the students in Free Code Camp, you see the life-changing effect that Quincy has provided with his free training. It's truly extraordinary, and it was great to hear from Quincy and a great reminder, again, of the amazing things that people are doing every single day. And I welcome uh, all of you to send in notes and identify things that you think are, that are amazing that are going on around you. You can get them to me on Twitter. I'm at Frank Blake there. Or email them to me at hello at crazy good turns. And I love sharing these stories with people on future podcasts, reconnecting with prior guests or whatever other things I think are exciting and inspiring to share with all of you. Again, thank you very much for listening. And now I think you're really going to enjoy this discussion with Alexa. So welcome, Alexa. It's great to have you on the show. It's wonderful to be here. So maybe we just start by describing a little bit about Open Impact and then how you came about to founding it, you know, the foundation story and Uh, A little bit about yourself. Open Impact is an advisory firm, and it helps people who want to do good and have impact in the world envision and design and accelerate their philanthropy in search of that impact. And it's really about helping people dig deep to reflect on the purpose of their wealth and assets and to think about how they can create a bigger legacy beyond that. And so we work with philanthropic families all over the country on issues that are far ranging and can be both local, hyper local to to global. And we do that with a lot of joy and persistence. And I would even say accountability because giving away money is hard work, especially if you want to have a big impact in the world. And so we try to make it accessible and we try to demystify some of the barriers that keep donors 
from moving and giving away their money, uh, you know, excess money that they will never need during their lifetimes. I would also say that sometimes my work feels very elite in terms of maybe inaccessible to people with smaller amounts of money. But many of the practices that we talk about and work with with our donor families are practices I practice in my own family, which is just really how do we take all of the resources at our disposal and and creatively think about how to make change on the issues we care about and in our communities. So I'm sure... I'm, I'm sure some of the folks listening are going, wow, I wish I had that job. I wish I was helping people give away money. That sounds like a great job. How, and I'm sure, as you said, it's both hard work, but it's also a great job. How did you get into it? What's the path that led you to where you are? It was literally a series of crazy good turns. I'm going to take this phrase of yours, Excellent. which I had never thought, heard of before. I had to, you know... When you, when you told me the name of this podcast and I started really understanding it, I was like, oh my gosh, I've had so many crazy good turns that led me to this moment. So I'm, I'm excited you asked me the question in that way. So the first crazy good turn is I arrived as an undergraduate on the UC Berkeley campus, having been pretty insulated in my middle-class suburban life in Southern California, and I encountered my first homeless people um, walking to school every day. And it was scary for me, but it also really raised my curiosity. And in a crazy good turn, I saw a sign on my way to school in front of a church that they were going to be serving homeless people that night, providing food and respite and games and uh, a movie, and they needed volunteers. So I, I talked to the woman who was setting up that sign. And every Wednesday uh, evening during my years as an undergrad at Berkeley, I began sitting with homeless people playing card games. They taught me how to play poker. And I learned they were military veterans. And I learned that they were deeply suffering from what we now know as PTSD. And I learned that they had deep stories and that they were intelligent and that they had so much to offer. And yet here they found themselves in this horrific circumstance. Um, It humanized that issue of homelessness to me It made me some really unusual friends. It was kind of fun because sometimes I'd be walking across campus, very collegiate. It was the 80s. I was super preppy with all my preppy friends. And I'd have a homeless person go like, hey, Alexa. (laughs) And we'd stop to talk. And my friends would be like, how do you know that person? And I knew them because I was hanging out, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with them on Wednesday nights. That took me to deciding I, I had to make a contribution yeah. in the social sector, in the change-making sector. And so I got out of college and took a job at what Peter Drucker considered the best managed nonprofit in America at the time, the American Heart Association. And so I thought, I've got to go work for the best-run nonprofit in the country. And I went and got a job there and kind of learned their secret sauce. And then the next crazy good turn is I started volunteering at an organization in San Francisco. And through that, met a donor who knew the Schwab family and invited me to interview with Chuck and Helen Schwab, the founder of Charles Schwab, to be one of their first foundation staff people. And the next crazy good turn is that after a year of doing that, Chuck offered me a year to be his founding executive director. I was 25 years old, and that began a 13-year partnership of uh, scaling up that philanthropy we're going down a side path, but I'm curious, what do you think he saw in you that prompted him to do that? At, you know, whatever you are, 25, 26 years old, and he says, and I'm assuming that he has a lot of resources involved in this foundation. And he goes, yes, Alexa, would you please run this? So we worked together for a year with me as a staff person on their team. And I think I was just really nimble, agile. I was organized. <laughs> he liked that I had an agenda and an outcome for every meeting. And he he could throw out ideas to me and I could quickly suss them out, analyze them and come back with a plan to either take them forward or to say like, this won't work. Wow. And after a year of doing that and also just proving that I was eager to learn and come up the learning curve with him in philanthropy and, and his wife, Helen, I think he just liked the fact that I wasn't coming with an agenda, that I was going to be in service to what the family wanted to do, which is really important to my advisory work now, that I was 
I was kind of neutral on what the issue was, but I was dogged on excellence. I was dogged on figuring it out. And that just formed an incredible 13 years of growth and opportunity where I got to lead one of the larger philanthropies in the country and just have a lot of really amazing relationships, stories of impact to show for that. Another crazy good turn is after 18 years of doing that, I then was the CEO of another private foundation. I went to Chuck to have lunch with him and told him I was thinking of setting up an advisory firm, but I was a little scared. But I said, I don't, I think I can take all the lessons that I learned and I can help other philanthropists accelerate their impact. And he said, why would you work for anyone but yourself? Like, why wouldn't you do that? Good for him. Good for He's him. like, it's, it's time to be your own boss. And he just gave me the, just that one sentence just kind of catapulted me into founding this firm. And many years later, we've unlocked and accelerated $12 billion of philanthropy toward really impactful organizations, leaders, and causes. So why, I mean, you preface this by talking about that it's hard work. Why is it hard work? What, may, what are some of the elements that make it difficult? My families and the founder are, are typically founders of companies, and they've been crazy successful, extraordinarily successful. My portfolio of work within the firm my typical client has a billion dollars or more in philanthropic assets. So they're crazy successful and they um, just naively assume that they're going to have an instinct for how to do this and make an impact. And they, they assume that the frameworks that have served them well in business will directly translate to serve them well in the social sector. And to some extent that's true, um, but there's a bunch of things that are missing if you just try to take your business frameworks and apply them to nonprofits because the sector is fundamentally broken and not structured in the way business is. So, you know, when you're raising revenue for a startup or a new venture, uh, there's a marketplace of capital and all kinds of capital to access. It's a mature marketplace. In the nonprofit sector, that doesn't exist. Um, in the business sector, you're never asked or questioned about the infrastructure you need to build to deliver your product or service. In the nonprofit sector, people are constantly examining what they consider your overhead. In the for-profit sector, it's just known that you have to innovate and have money for research and development. In the nonprofit sector, there's no such thing and there's no margin for such thing. That is fascinating, just going through those differences. That, I mean, you can see the challenge. If you take one step back and comment, I'd love to hear your comments on why. I mean, I, I don't know what the number is that uh, the country gives out philanthropically, but I've got to believe it's enormous every year. I think it's almost half a trillion dollars. So it's a half a trillion dollars. But the average, I think I read in something you wrote, Alexa, that it's less than 1% of the nonprofits have more than $50 million in revenue. Is that, am I remembering that right? right. That's right. That's a Silicon Valley figure, but it, okay. you know, it's generally right nationally. So the, yeah. vast, the vast majority of nonprofits kind of don't have staff, don't have more than a million dollars of revenue. They're little cottage nonprofits, and they typically, you know, are a group of people coming together. They might not even be raised, you know, they, they might not even have fundraising as their primary goal. The work philanthropy and, you know, when you give money away, you're typically looking at nonprofits that have a big enough budget that the community can know about them, right? Yeah. Um, they, they exist and they're operating in the community and they typically will have some kind of profile, although I think the majority of nonprofits need to have larger profiles. What do you mean by a high profile? What's, what do you mean by that? What we found out in our study about Silicon Valley, and we did a report five years ago about giving in Silicon Valley that's resonated in, in cities all over the country. And it's been uh, cited and covered by media outlets from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal to the Financial Times. So because the core insights really resonate. And, and so a core insight in that report was that despite having all these community-based nonprofits, wealthy people in the community didn't know about them and didn't fully understand the level of social issues happening. So believe it or not, Frank, in Silicon Valley, which is one of the largest economies in the world, most wealthy people don't know that one in three kids in the valley is hungry, suffers from food insecurity. 
just because they're not interacting with that world. world. Yeah. So even right. even though, you know, if you're in Palo Alto, which is where Stanford is, you know, just across the freeway is East Palo Alto. And many communities have this exact same visual. You right. have it in your community, right? right? There's a street you cross and suddenly the world changes. And that world is really cut off, um, even though it might just be half a mile away. Uh, from that world that has incredible resources. The world with resources, you know, where they shop, where they go to church, uh, where they socialize, where they send their kids to school, doesn't give them any exposure to the fact that there's kids who actually are food insecure on that side of the street. And in Silicon Valley, that's exactly the issue. And so donors don't know about those issues as much as you would hope they would. They, and they certainly don't really know about the nonprofits helping them. The worlds of the nonprofit leaders just are very separate and they don't collide very often. And so that's a real problem. And so, you know, I'm going to go back to my original thought is donors, you know, really fret about the overhead of nonprofits. But if a nonprofit can't communicate its impact, can't um, have a social media strategy, can't build a decent website, can't get its profile out into the community, it's really never going to be able to attract the resources to begin helping those food insecure children. We just have a problem, a real disconnect between the way donors and, and wealthier communities understand these issues and how the nonprofits that serve them are constructed. And in our report, we actually interviewed 300 people, a hundred of whom were donors and a couple hundred nonprofit leaders. And it was like, we were talking to two different completely wow. different worlds of people. And then when we looked at the data, it was extraordinary because everybody knows the Silicon Valley story. The wealth is extraordinary here. You know, we have 150,000 millionaires and billionaires in the two counties below San Francisco. If you add in San Francisco, you're getting to like 300,000. Uh, there's 77 billionaires in San Francisco alone. It's a pretty small town. So there's extraordinary wealth here. And we found out there's extraordinary philanthropy. We're one of the most philanthropic regions in the world in terms of, if you look at the IRS data. But then we sat down with 150 nonprofit leaders of community-based organizations. These are people who run homeless programs, run after-school programs. Yeah. We literally were in the room with 150 of them all at once, actually. We were in an enormous room and we ran focus groups and we mapped all of their needs and demands on post-its all over the room. And what we discovered is that despite all this escalating exponential growth and revenue in the Valley and wealth in the Valley, um, that they were experiencing unprecedented demand for services. So demand for services was up, meaning more people were knocking on their door needing help. And when we asked them, well, aren't you getting all this money? Like, there's money hanging on the trees. And they were like, no, our major donor support and our individual donor support is pretty stagnant. We're not seeing this money. So then we're like, wait a minute. The IRS and all the giving reports are saying that we're like one of the most generous re regions in the, in the country. Where's the money going? So we did something pretty extraordinary. We called Fidelity Charitable and Schwab Charitable, which are the biggest donor advice fund holders in the country. A donor advice fund is kind of a savings account for philanthropic what? dollars. Yeah. You can donate into those funds, get your tax deduction, just like you would donating to the food bank. But you get, you get then some time to figure out uh, where you want to give it. If you have a wealth event, it can be a really quick strategy for putting a bunch of money in that fund and then figuring it out. And so we asked Schwab and Fidelity to disaggregate the, the donor advised fund activity in Silicon Valley. And we found something that we now know is generalizable to a lot of communities, probably Atlanta, New York, yeah. Boston. It's the same trend. Um, and I know this because people who read the report in other cities called me and said, oh my gosh, it's just like That's we awesome. could, it's literally like we could change Silicon Valley to my community and the right. insights would be the same. So astoundingly, we found that uh, the philanthropic assets, the majority of them were leaving the region to go to alma maters, to go globally. The money that stayed was staying for things 
that were mostly institutional. People's Stanford, you know, Stanford has over a thousand development staff. They're incredible at raising money. And a lot of people go to Stanford stay in Silicon Valley. I teach a class um, at Stanford Continuing Studies and I, I do guest speaking at the business school. And so, and Stanford gave me an incredible platform to uh, advance my thinking on philanthropy. So I, I love Stanford. My husband's a graduate of the business school. Um, but, you know, a lot of donors just don't know what to do with their money and Stanford's right there with an ask. And so it's a yeah. really easy transaction for them. And it's a safe transaction. They had a personal experience with Stanford. It hugely benefited them. Similarly, yeah. donors love to give to hospitals because it benefited them in some way. It saved their their mother. It, it performed a vital surgery. Um, so donors tend, when they give locally, to give to what's familiar and where they've seen personal benefit. So extraordinarily, we found that less than 5% of the money staying was going to these community-based organizations. So within the, so effectively, all of this money, about 5%, was going back into the communities. That was all that was going back. That was our answer, right? Because we had these 150 nonprofit leaders saying, we're not seeing the money. And we, we were confounded. But once we like just kept digging and digging the story got more clear. You know, when we disaggregated down to the level of the community-based organization, which was a huge research feat, by the way, not just like how much money went to the region. If you look at how much money went to the region, it looks extraordinary. But when you start taking out, it just goes down and down and down till you get to less than 5%. And it was true across what we call all asset classes. It was true from donor-advised funds. It was true from foundations in the area. Uh, it was true from corporate giving. You know, we have some of the most extraordinary technology companies in the world based here. And it was a pretty uh, astonishing revelation for people as we went out to talk. So, Alexa, this is, as you referenced, I mean, the report, which is called The Giving Code, and you know, maybe our listeners will go track it down or we'll, and we'll provide a link to it. But... Um, it, it got a lot of play, and a lot of people wrote about it, a lot of people thought about it, and it came out in 2016. Have you seen any behavioral changes? Have people taken that to heart? So what's happened since 2016? Well, Silicon Valley has gotten exponentially richer. The millionaires and billionaires, like they've, they've doubled in the two counties that we reported on in 2016. So the the 80,000 we reported on then doubled to the number I told you earlier, the 150. And then you add in San Francisco, you get more like to 300,000. I mean, it goes on and on. The social problems have increased. Uh, the middle class is shrinking. The cost of living continues to go up. During COVID, our housing market got more expensive. Our teachers, police, and fire people now live so far away from our communities that if an earthquake happened or wildfires happened, uh, there's a huge problem because they'd have to get across bridges to get to our communities because most of Silicon Valley and San Francisco, you, you, you have to come across a bridge to access it. So we've actually like pushed all those people. So, you know, people might think, well, those are just poor people, people who don't want to work, leaving the community. No, no, no. These are like vital critical services of people who cannot live here and now can't even come in an earthquake to staff hospitals. Um, you know, if I were to be hurt, I, I can't count on my hospital a mile away. And again, the same in other areas where you've seen the Again, the same. I can't count on my fire, my fire crews to be fully staffed. Um, so, so that's really a problem, and it's, it's been exacerbated. Now, that said... The Giving Code spurred a bunch of funders to come together to actually create a pool of funds and several initiatives and to build the capacity of what I'm going to call like brokers or intermediaries in our community. And that has been some of the most promising bright spots that we're seeing. So one of the insights of the Giving Code is, okay, if you really have this deep disconnection between donors and nonprofits, what if we create more, more brokers who can connect them who kind of speak both languages, who are like bilingual. <laughs> who are those translators? And those translators are giving circles. So there's now just huge networks of giving circles in Silicon Valley that a donor can join, join that educates them, helps them connect to nonprofits and where they get to be with their peers, learning about the community, going on site visits, and then pulling funding. 
Um, so one of them is called Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund, and that's a network all over the country in, in cities everywhere. Giving circles cool. exist in cities everywhere. I didn't even realize that. That's fascinating. Community foundations exist everywhere. Yeah. You have a community foundation yeah. in your, Atlanta. In, in your yeah. Atlanta. And community foundations are awesome places for people to go to understand local community issues and to get advice and support. Um, you can also open up a donor advice fund at a community foundation. And what's nice about that versus at one of the big institutional brands like Fidelity is that you get access to kind of local giving advice. Um, so education programs for donors are opening up all across the country. And so in Silicon Valley, a lot of funders doubled down on helping build stronger brokers. Um, Stanford now has a philanthropy lab and it trains wealth advisors on how to connect and be wow. better advisors to their clients because wealth advisors are often sitting in between um, their clients and their philanthropy. Uh, they're helping them plan for philanthropy. Right. Yeah. And so helping wealth advisors have more nuanced Understand skills. what the resources are out there and the like, yeah. Yeah, wealth advisors tend to be pretty conservative in terms of money. And so uh, a typical wealth advisor loves to tell you you should give to your alma mater because, you know, they know the University of Pennsylvania is reliable. So that just seems fine. But wealth advisors really don't know how to tell you to give to a food bank or how to give to a nonprofit in your community. That seems a little riskier. Um, that's not their skill set. So equipping them and helping them understand how to activate their clientele is um, an initiative that has been really strong in Silicon Valley. Um, a group of funders also started a group called Magnify Community, and we started a pledge where we asked donors in the community that initiative to pledge to give uh, a significant portion of their resources locally. And so people signed that pledge, and that activated $120 million plus. Wow. When you start putting brokers and 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 guides into the ecosystem, we're beginning to see changes. Alexa, what about advice for donors? Let's assume you're speaking to people who don't have billionaire-type resources but also want to make a difference with their giving. What should they do? Well, once you find a nonprofit that you're excited about, you know, that really resonates with you, a nonprofit that's extending critical after-school programs to kids to expose them to music and the arts or to make sure that they're not falling behind in math or reading, or you find a nonprofit that's, you know, really uh, helping house homeless people, whatever that would be, whatever resonates with you. Um, I think the key is to learn about them and to go into listening mode and, um, and to kind of suspend all your beliefs and, uh, and to be willing to kind of consider a different view of how those organizations are working and solving problems. So just being a curious, open-minded um, listener and learner, I think is the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is ask that nonprofit what they actually need. And typically what they'll tell you is we need unrestricted funding and we need multi-year commitments. We need to know you're going to stick with us over time. Our model is always going to be a philanthropic model. There's just no magic way that nonprof most nonprofits can raise money other than donors coming and, and helping them scale up their work. And so donors shouldn't have a mindset of, oh, this nonprofit needs to figure out a revenue model. The revenue model is the donor model. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of nonprofits that have some really extraordinary alternative revenue models, but there's always a piece that where private philanthropy and donors giving is critical. Yeah, it just have to be. Yeah. It's just always part of it um, yeah. in almost every case. And so I would say give without restriction, give multi-year, and then ask that nonprofit how you can use all your resources. How can you use your networks, your relationships, your influence, yeah. and your money uh, to support and help them. And just think about really investing in them. As a tangible example, my family for the last 25 years has doubled down on a nonprofit in San Francisco called New Door Ventures. It gives kids with um, who just are really far from opportunity. They, they have all kinds of risk factors, the kinds of risk factors that if our kids had even one of them, we would be really worried about them. These kids have multiple, and we help them 
uh, get ready to have their first job and we connect them to their first job. And then we make sure they're successful in that first job. We build their confidence, we build their resume, and our kids stick with education and growth in jobs uh, because of our program at a much higher percentage rate than kids who haven't had the program. And it changes the trajectory of their lives. And our family gives money to that nonprofit. Over the years, I've served on the board of that profit, that nonprofit. I've been the chair. There have been years where I haven't been on the board. We volunteer like our entire family goes. Um, my kids have, have offered free volunteer and internship services during the summers where they don't get paid, but they go and provide help to the teams there. Um, you know, my husband and I will get on and do resume reviews with youth. There's resume writing workshops where a volunteer sits with the youth and helps them get their resume better. You know, we, in our family, we just think of all of that. We invite friends to learn about it. We take them on tours. We give them giving opportunities. We think about all the ways that we have influence to help this nonprofit. And we've done it for 25 years, and it's been extraordinary. We feel like we're part of the family. We haven't just said, oh, you know, they'll figure it out. We'll do it for a few years. So it it can be really transformational when you connect to a nonprofit like that or, or a portfolio of nonprofits and really just show up ready to help. That's phenomenal advice. Folks who are starting, because we, we've had a lot of um, people on the show or people who write into the show who have their own, just as you say, a local nonprofit that's doing great things. If you were advising them about how to connect with the, you know, the different assets out there, what would your advice to them be? The first thing that I want you to do if you're a nonprofit is I want you to think about how you're going to tell your story and and really get clear on just what is the problem you're trying to solve and how are you solving it and also learn to tell a quantitative story. So nonprofits love to tell qualitative stories. They love to um, to kind of share their results in terms of anecdotes and heartwarming stories, and often will have qualitative ways of reporting their impact. And all of that is critical and essential. It's what I would call necessary, but insufficient. Right. Donors speak typically the language of quantitative results, because that's what they're used to in their day-to-day jobs. And so a story or anecdote will go, will go far with them, and they might even give some money. But if you can start telling a quantitative story, they're going to stick with you. They're going to trust you. Their understanding of you is going to grow. And, and they're just going to, you're going to build a bridge to them in terms of speaking more of their language. I learned this, honestly, working for Chuck Schwab. I would come in to report on our portfolios of grant investments, and all he wanted was numbers. And so, you know, I realized, I'm like, okay, he cares about the anecdotes. He likes the heartwarming stories, but I've got to lead with the numbers. I've got to be able to report to him very clearly from a quantitative perspective what is being accomplished. And that doesn't tell the full story. So I also have to make sure that we as a philanthropy are also taking into consideration the qualitative data. So it was a both and, but nonprofits typically don't do a good enough job of the quantitative side and need to invest more in that part of the story. And then go out to the donors that you have and share that story and ask them for feedback. Ask them to help you make it better. That is, that is just brilliant advice. That is fantastic. Final question, what's been the most fun? So in this job, it's hard. You got a lot of, I assume you're interacting with a lot of folks with a big ego, got pretty good ideas of what they want to do. Underneath it, though, there's something really fun. Uh, What is so fun is when you help a donor who has just encountered a lot of difficulties where you get to the point where you've channeled all their energy and passion, their values, found an issue they care about, found some incredible nonprofits and portfolios of nonprofits um, that they can fund and have, make a material difference with, and where you see them beginning to experience the joy of giving. And fear, which is a huge, huge, undiscussed part of philanthropy. Many philanthropists live with a huge amount of fear. I know this because I've done all kinds of research on the inner lives of donors. 
Um, their number one issue is fear. Fear of being um, taken were, advantage of. Fear of fear of failure. Frank, these are uh, high, these are uh, these are incredibly successful people. They do uh, not want to fail. Uh, and so, once you begin to show them their successes and show them the path to success, and they begin to reap the to, to just see the impact that's unfolding. Just there's just a lot of joy that comes, and it's kind of that sober joy, right? Because we're working on hard issues, and we have to keep moving and keep going. And so there's a sober joy with like, wow, I'm starting to figure this out, and it's it's something tremendous is happening. And when I see those planning meetings turn into that kind of result, it gets it it's just really exciting. And when we help a philanthropist set a goal. And they, you know, to spend out um, a very specific amount of dollars and to do that really impactfully, and they meet that goal, that's a pretty big day. You know, it's a really great feeling. Very cool. So at the start, you gave some crazy good turns that impact your life. Is there some other that you'd call out that you'd just say, wow, this, this was a crazy good turn someone did for me? You know, in high school, I got invited to a zero period class that was being introduced into my public high school with 3,800 kids, um, an extraordinary uh, history and social studies teacher named Ken Ammon, who's still a dear friend of mine, was creating a model United Nations program at our school. And I got to help start that program. I had to arrive every morning at 6.30 to do that. But that program uh, helped me know that I could read, write, argue, speak, present, improvise. I got to travel to cities all over the country that I had never been to, get exposed to kids, issues, you know, represent countries, argue things from all points of view, depending on the country that I had to represent. And that was a game-changing experience for me. And I use those skills every day in, in my work. And I think it's been really key to driving the impact I've had in my life. Um, so that was a crazy good turn. I have so I, many, Frank. I could like go on and on. We could just do an interview about my crazy good turns. That is a wonderful one. That is phenomenal. Alexa, this has been just so outstanding, such great advice and so many insights. For people who are listening and say, boy, I'd like to learn more about Alexa, where should they go? Well, we're launching a new website in January, and we have a current one that has all of our research and writing on it, and it's at openimpact.io, so the name of my firm, .io, and there's an insights page where you can read all the things we're writing about. Which, by the way, I've looked at and is spectacular. And that's a way to find me. And you can also sign up for our firm newsletter there where we share insights that the firm is uh, discovering, we relay cool things going on in our work and share what we're learning. This is spectacular. Thank you, Alexa. This has been a, a great, great pleasure. And I know everybody's really enjoyed listening to this. I know I've learned so much. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you for doing it. It's a great idea. I'd like to end the show as I began with a request uh, that you send in examples of crazy good things that have been done for you. So if uh, there is a crazy good turn, someone did a kind deed for you, someone set a great example for you, please send your thoughts to us on Twitter or email them to us at hello at crazygoodturns.org. We'll share your stories in future episodes of the podcast. I'd like to close by thanking our excellent production team, Brian Sabin, Megan Hanlon, Stephen Key, and score a score in Los Angeles. Without their help, this podcast would not exist. So we thank them very much and look forward to having you on our next podcast. Thanks. Bye.